Well, good morning. Welcome to Alexandria Covenant Church. We are looking forward to our time of worship together. We just invite you to stand. We're going to sing praise to our God today. Good morning again. We welcome you to Alexandria Covenant Church. It's a good day to gather and to worship together. And whether you're joining us in the sanctuary or you're over in the great room or online, we're so glad that you're here. And we really are excited for our time together. If you're a guest with us today, we would invite you to fill out a connect form. They're on the back of the pew in front of you. Uh, Just fill out that information, drop it in the offering plate on your way out. It gives us a chance to get to know you better. And we have an online option for that form. If you're joining us online today, go to our 
our website, and then you can find the link for that. As we continue in worship, we're going to sing a song that we learned two weeks ago. Uh, it's fashioned after the Lord's Prayer. And um, I'm going to say the Lord's Prayer, the version that I learned, um, but you're invited to say it along with me. Uh, but we read uh, in a couple of the Gospels where Jesus taught us to pray, and he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. And as we continue in our worship, I think it's always good to reflect on the words that we're singing, the words of this song that are a prayer, where we're acknowledging who God is. We are asking him to be with us. We are inviting his will to be done in our life. We're asking that he would supply for our needs according to his measure, that we're recognizing that we need him to help us as we daily face the temptation to sin. So, sing with us as we sing the Lord's Prayer. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will done on earth as in heaven right here in my heart father let your kingdom come father let your will be done on earth as in heaven right here in my heart give us this day of daily bread forgive us forgive us as we forgive Against us, forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come, Father, let your kingdom come, Father, let your will be done on earth. Let your kingdom come, Father, let your will be done, on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day of daily bread, forgive us, forgive us, as we forgive the ones who sinned against us, forgive them, and lead us not into temptation, but to live. That is a prayer of yours.
this past week, um, I've just had the opportunity to think a lot about the fact that it's because of God's faithfulness, his promises, that we have any hope at all in this world. We can look for something to satisfy, to give us assurance, but if it's not God, it won't be real and it won't last. And we know that God is a faithful God because throughout scripture, he shows us that over and over again. And the writer in Hebrews uh, talks about this very thing. It's Hebrews chapter six, and it's a little lengthy, but I wanna read it for you. It says, there was God's promise to Abraham. Since there was no one greater to swear by, God took an oath in his own name saying, I will certainly bless you and I will multiply your descendants beyond number. Then Abraham waited patiently, and he received what God had promised. Now, when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without any question, that oath is binding. God also bound himself with an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great 
confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is strong and trustworthy, an anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. So as we sing this next song, let's be reminded of the faithfulness of God and that he is worthy of our worship regardless of the circumstances before us.
we acknowledge today that you are faithful. We see it throughout your word where you have shown us over and over again that you keep your promises. And we believe that today. Thank you, God, for the love that you give to us. Would you be with us today as we continue in worship, as we hear from your word, God, move in our hearts that we would be drawn closer to you, to love you more, to follow you better and more fully. You are good and we love you. Amen. You can be seated. Hey, it's so good to be with you today. I want to remind you that fall is coming quickly. Boo, right? We don't want summer to go anywhere. Yet at the same time, when I say fall is coming quickly, we can get excited about what Alexandria Covenant has to offer for you and your family. And one of the things we're doing a little bit different this year is bringing up our ministry leaders of the various areas of ministry in the church to be able to share with you what you can expect and what our ministries do, for the most part, to serve you and your families. Today, I'm going to invite up Pastor Brian and Sarah Erickson, who are our middle school and high school uh, ministry staff. And uh, I'm so excited because I want you as a church family to realize that we have solid men and women of the faith who are leading our students and our families faithfully and well. And I praise God for that. And amen, right? If you're wanting more information about student ministry after the service, uh, Pastor Brian and Sarah will be in the patio. They would love to meet with you and visit with you more about how you can be involved or get your children, students involved in the ministry as well. So Pastor Brian, Sarah, thanks for all you do. Thanks for sharing your story. We just want to introduce ourselves. I'm Brian Farka. I'm the pastor of student ministries here at Alexander Covenant Church. I oversee all of student ministry, but work mostly with high school students. And I'm Sarah Erickson, and I'm the director of middle school ministry, so I get to hang out with the sixth through eighth graders. Um, we just wanted to give you guys, as part of our ministry highlight, a really quick look at some of the things that we get to do in student ministry in a year. So. Well, I can say we love what we do. You get a little taste of some of the things we got to do this last year. Um, but we have a great team of leaders and a great group of students and families we get to work with. There are three things that really drive our youth ministry, and that we just want to share those things with you this morning. The first is uh, the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15.3 says the gospel is of first importance, and that's something we weave through all of our youth ministry. Um, you may say, well, what does the gospel mean? A few weeks ago, I did a sermon, and I gave it just a 25-word um, definition of the gospel, and here's what it is. The wrong things we do separate us from God. Messiah Jesus died, taking our punishment, and rose again, proving he is God. Trust in him. We want our students and families to know Jesus and to follow him, and so we weave the gospel through all of the things we do and give opportunities for them to accept Christ. The second thing is the Word of God. We believe that God's Word is unco His uncompromising Word to us. Um, our teaching is, is saturated in God's Word. Everything we do is surrounded with God's Word. Our small group questions, any counsel we give, drives it right back to what God says in His Scripture. We believe a firm foundation of faith cannot happen apart from reading and applying God's Word to life.
Yeah. And the third thing that we value is relationships. We know that discipleship is always done best in the context of authentic relationship with God and each other. And we also know that statistically, the impact of caring adults in the life of a student when it comes to faith formation is huge. Um, We want all of our students, when they come into our student ministry, to know and believe that they're loved and cared for by God and by us. Um, And so that's why we also, as part of our programming, uh, we do small groups, we do retreats and trips, because we know that those are the moments um, that are really forming those relationships in a stronger way. Um, But when it comes down to it, all of our programming, whether that's on Wednesdays and Sundays or special events, are all designed to prioritize those three things, the gospel, God's word, and relationships. We have a really amazing team of volunteers that pour into our students on a regular basis and help us create that environment for them. Um, And we're also really grateful to you guys as our church family for valuing student ministry, for caring for our students, and for inviting them into the life of the church in meaningful ways. Um, This week in your bulletin, you will find, not my notes, but one of these um, updates from Brian and I. It's just a little message and some ways that you can join us in praying for our students this year. So we would love love for you as a church family to join us in that. Again, afterwards, we'll be in the patio, and we would love to connect with you if you want to know more. Thanks. Yes, and thank you. Uh, My name is Greg Donnelly. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. Um, I work with those who are gifted in years. Amen. All right. At 65 and above, but a wonderful group to work with. Uh, I just want to bring three announcements about what's coming up. There's many things going on in church, but uh, I just want to call your attention to a few few things here. Uh, First of all, uh, for the women, there will be a picnic on Tuesday. This is two days from now, and it'll be at Kurt Felt Memorial Park at 6 o'clock. And there will be a meal... Uh, lawn games, there'll be prizes. You know, I don't know what the prizes are. It could be a new car, it could be a new house, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Not sure. But anyway, uh, bring a lawn chair to come when you come and, and bring a friend or two. But you'll learn about what's going on. The women's ministry team uh, will talk about things that are coming up. So it'll be a good time to be together. So 6 o'clock, Tuesday. And then a week from today, on Sunday, and this is Sunday night at 7 o'clock in the patio. This is going to be where you can learn, take on some new tools as far as Bible study. We've got a great teacher here. Um, Holly Krauser is... Holly, are you here? Downstairs. Okay. Well, trust me, she's a good teacher. And uh, you'll have a great time in this. But uh, be sure to sign up so they have enough pamphlets. And she'll be giving these out. These are... Um, like a journal type of thing for the book of Ephesians. So a very practical thing, and it'll be a, a great time together. So please sign up, and um, you'll be glad you did. It's just a one-time, it's from 7 to 9, it's just a one-time thing. We're going to be going into Ephesians come next month. So that's kind of the kickoff start. Okay, then we have another thing, and that is called the Alpha program. Now, Alpha is basically... I don't know where this alpha means, the first letter of the Greek alphabet. It's like alpha, omega. We go A to Z. Well, they go alpha, omega. But alpha uh, is a program also, and it was written by a guy by the name of Nicky Gumbel. Now, Nicky uh, is from England, and he grew up in a home which was atheistic. No one believed in God, and he was an atheist himself. But he was converted to Christ, and Jewish too, and he was converted to Christ, and he came out with this thing to help people learn about who Christ is and about the whole process and on and on. It's just really good. So it's going to start Thursdays, September 14th, and there will be a meal involved too. So that starts at 6 o'clock, and then after that will be the, the teaching time. But we not just uh, after people that are you know wondering about this and wondering about that, but it's people who have been Christians for a long time. So it's, it's all of us. It's healthy for all of us. So that's our new um, fall programming. So if you haven't seen it yet, it's in the bulletin, and this is what it looks like. Just pull it out and read about it. But uh, if you can join us, do that. 
And then the offering, just want to mention about that. You know, when you come together, we, we worship through music. And we worship through the Word of God. And we also worship through giving. And that's the offering. And remember this, it really is giving for eternity. In fact, it's, it's just an eternal investment when it's talking about people. Not just locally, but also worldwide. And so when you give, give joyfully and generously, and they'll, that'll take place right outside the doors. And then for the kids, we'd have just a moment for them. Uh, you have to qualify for this now. So you have to be four years old, and you have to graduate from second grade. And that's your cue. Now, we're going to let them go, but all of us now can do what you've been waiting for to do for all morning. Shake one another's hands or give a bump or something. But uh, let's do that. And remember to stay standing because I'm going to read the scripture. Okay, this is from the Sermon of the Mount. For those of you that are new, are new here, we've been doing this for a while. It's a wonderful section. Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 1. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven, for so are they that persecuted the prophets who were before you. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor Greg, for reading the scripture this morning for us. Before I draw your attention to the message today, I do want to point out um, the flower on stage to my left. Uh, a white rose is always an indication of a decision to say, yes, I want to follow Jesus. And this past week, actually, during our lunchtime at the end of the service, Pastor Shanda was sitting with a family, and a fourth grade boy had an opportunity to share with Pastor Shanda his opportunity of coming to faith in Jesus with his family recently. And so as a result of that, we're just acknowledging the fact that a mom and dad recently had an opportunity to sit with their four, fourth grade boy as he made a decision to say, I want to follow Jesus. I want him to forgive my sin, and I want him to be the Lord of my life. And as a result of that, let's acknowledge that and celebrate it today. All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them to Matthew chapter 5. It will be our starting point today. Um, and before we get into the message, I invite you to pray with me. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to open your word and to spend time together in it. Holy Spirit, uh, lead us in this time. Reveal to us the truth of your word. Encourage us that we may become all who you've made us to be as a child of the living God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we're going to talk about peace. I hope peace is something that you're familiar with, even something that you have in your life. Uh, it's certainly a word that uh, I have no doubt everybody wants to experience, but also have no doubt that too few people have it today. Isn't that true? Peace is something everybody wants. Sadly, though, peace is something that not everybody has, and yet it is desired by all. The idea of peace really dominates the Bible. If we were to take a survey of the Bible, what we would discover is that 
The Bible opens with peace and it closes with peace. It, it opens with peace in the Garden of Eden. And as it closes with peace, it closes with peace in eternity. But between the opening and the close of the Bible, what we realize and what we discover is that peace is not something that really exists in the world, but between the Garden of Eden and eternity, God is now at work restoring and bringing peace back to his creation. And he's doing this through the work of his son, Jesus Christ. Throughout the Bible, we will find over 400 references to peace. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace, and God calls himself the God of Peace. I'll be honest with you, and, and just in a, in a moment of transparency this morning, the past couple weeks of, of my life have been really challenging as I've been invited into people's lives who are working through some troubling times as they're seeking peace. And it's heavy and it's burdensome. And as I come this morning talking about peace, I come to you as a pastor who has great privilege to walk along many of you in times where your life is in disarray and you're seeking peace. And what a privilege it is to be on journey for those seeking peace. So why is there no peace anyway in this world? Well, simply the reason there's no peace is because there is sin in the world. It all started in the garden. God was at peace with his creation. And then through Adam and Eve and their disobedience to God's commands, they sinned. And as a result of their sin, sin entered the world and created a division between God and his creation. And now we live with the damaging effect that peace has on our lives. Because of sin, the Bible says we are at war with God. To be clear, God is not at war with us. We are the ones who are at war with God. We're at war with God because of the sin in our life, and we're born this way. The Bible actually calls this depravity. Total depravity. And because of the total depravity in our life, we have a division between us and God that needs to be reconciled in order for us to have peace. See, peace comes from God, and the only way we can experience true peace is through the person that God has assigned to bring peace into this world. His name is Jesus Christ. There are three kinds of peace that we find in the Bible. The Bible reveals to us that, that, that God sent his son that we might have peace with God, that we can experience peace from God, and that we can also have the peace of God in our life. Those are the three kinds of peace that the Bible actually speaks about. The first one being the peace with God is simply a real uh, understanding of the gospel and the implication that the gospel can have on our lives as we are separated from being in right relationship with God as a result of our sin. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live a life we couldn't live. He died a death we deserved to die so that we could gain a right relatedness to God the Father that we could never gain on our own. And this was accomplished through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so to have peace with God is to recognize our need for God. And the only way we can be right related to God is through Jesus Christ. And so when we accept Jesus as the Savior of our life, the one who saves us from our sin and the Lord of our life, who leads us, guides us, and directs us through life, we recognize it is then and only then that we can actually have peace with God. But there's another kind of peace. It's a peace from God. And peace from God is, is simply knowing that I'm living in the will of God. 
Have you ever been in a situation or a predicament where you just were really seeking to discern God's will for your life and, and you were not settled in the direction of your life, but you were being called in another direction and, and, and as a result, it was in that direction that you were finding peace with God? Or really the peace that comes uh, from God? I'll tell you, when Gwen and I were uh, considering moving to Alexandria from Bismarck, we were not interested in leaving our church because we had a great church with a great ministry. We had great relationships. And then all of a sudden, this opportunity came up, and we were like, yeah, no, not interested, sorry. Yet God began to work us over a little bit, began to change our heart, began to redirect our heart towards this call. And so we sat with the Lord, and, and as we sat with the Lord, what we began to discover is that our heart became more content in the context of ministry we were, and it grew stronger towards coming to Alexandria. And as a result of that, at the end of the day, we experienced peace from God when we recognized his call for us to move from Bismarck to Alexandria and lived into that. It was then that we experienced a peace from God that moved us into the will of God. We were living in the will of God there, of course, as well, but God was moving us on. And this is true for any of us seeking the will of God for our life. There's a peace we can gain from him when we live his will. And then there's the peace of God. And this is truly to experience the fruit of, of what it means to walk with God in, in obedience. One of the fruit of the Spirit is simply peace. This type of peace is a peace that we gain when life might be uh, tumultuous and, and chaotic all around us, and yet somehow, some way, we can be at peace. You might see this as you look to the world today that is just an absolute chaotic mess. And somehow when you walk with God in the will of God, you can experience a peace of God that others who are not with God can have. It's attractive to those in the world because it's the very thing that they are seeking. And only those who belong to the family of God can actually experience this kind of peace. See, some people want to define peace as the absence of conflict or strife. That is not what peace is. You know what that is? That's called a cold war. You ever been in conflict with your spouse? And at the end of the day, you resolve to, we're just not going to talk about it anymore. And you go to bed and you're silent. At least you're not fighting and you're laying on your pillow and you think, oh, finally, I got a little peace. I don't have to listen to her or him, ah, right? Amen, right? That, that's not peace. That's a cold war. All you've done is stop barking at each other. Your circumstances haven't changed. Peace is more than the absence of something. It also includes the presence of right relatedness. We can't miss this. This is what peace is all about, writing something that's broken relationally. When we think about peace and being a peacemaker, it's really bringing two enemies together in love. Consider the word shalom. It means to possess all of God's goodness needed to be at peace with others. It's a thing that God wants us to have in our life, to experience shalom. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, we read, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Well, what is a peacemaker anyway? Peacemakers are honest. They're honest about the state of the relationships in their own lives. And they're also honest about the state of relationships around them, in the lives of others around them. 
A peacemaker is also willing to risk pain and misunderstanding to make things right. That's what a peacemaker is. And that's what a peacemaker does. A peacemaker pursues right relatedness in relationships. So a question we all have to wrestle with is how does God want to use me as a peacemaker? We're going to learn a little bit about that this morning. Because the bottom line is, is that God's plan for bringing peace into this world, it includes us who are a part of his family, and it's not optional. It becomes part of who we are and what we do as the children of God in a world that desperately needs peace. So if you're taking notes this morning, my first point is that peacemaking is actually gospel work. Peacemaking is gospel work. It begins with our relationship with God being made right through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. I alluded to this earlier, and I want to let you know what Paul says about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. As God makes us right with him, he sends us out into the world so that we can be his ambassador, we can be his hands, we can be his feet, we can be his mouthpiece as we pursue people who are still at war with God because of the depravity of their soul and the sin in their life, so they too can be reconciled unto a holy God through the forgiveness of their sin. It is your responsibility and mine as a Christian to be a peacemaker in this world who desperately pursues people who are at odds with God and have a broken relationship with God so that he can help mend that relationship and give them life. Colossians chapter 1, Paul says, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. So what was the price to reconcile us to God? The death of Jesus, the shedding of blood. God doesn't need to be reconciled to us because he's not at war with us. But we need to be reconciled to him because we are at war with him. We must get the direction of this right or we won't understand God for who he is and what he's done for us. There's three ways upon which we can identify peacemaking as gospel work. And the first is this, we must make peace with God ourselves. If you are here this morning and you have never trusted Jesus to forgive you of your sin, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and to make you right with God the Father, then I'm here to tell you today The only way you'll ever get peace in your life is by beginning there. You cannot be a peacemaker who gives peace away when you yourself don't even have the peace to give. And the only way you can be a peacemaker is by knowing a peace that comes through the person of Jesus Christ. Come unto Jesus. Let him save you from your sin cleanse you from unrighteousness, 
and give you a life so that you can begin to live for him. The second way is that we are to help others make peace with God. That's what evangelism is all about. And this is the mission of the church. Once you have peace with God, it's now our responsibility to share that peace with others and help others who are outside the faith come into the family of God as they too are reconciled unto Christ. This isn't optional. This is your responsibility and mine as Christians. And then finally, we are to make peace with others and to bring them together with each other. That's how peacemaking becomes gospel work. When we recognize our offense against a brother or sister and we go to them directly to mend that offense, we are a peacemaker. If we see a brother who is at odds with a brother, being a peacemaker means that we step into the ring with them. We take the hits with them. We get in the trenches with them. We give ourselves to reconcile that which is broken so that a right relatedness can be restored and renewed. That's what a peacemaker does. A peacemaker is willing to get in the fight to bring peace between a brother or a sister, to help others who are at odds with each other be at peace with each other. And God wants us to be a peacemaker in all the spaces and places in life that he has put us. In our family, in our marriage, in our workplace, in our friendships, in our church, Everywhere God has placed us, he wants us to be a peacemaker. Can I just speak briefly to the status and condition of marriages today? Can I truly get your attention just for a moment? In the last two weeks, the five of us who are pastors here at Alexandria Covenant Church I've been invited into seven, seven marriages that are on the brink of divorce. Seven in two weeks. Being a peacemaker is stepping into the hard spaces and places in life that you're invited and working with people who are in trouble to get out of trouble so that they can store, restore what's broken and have right relatedness to one another and to God. I can't tell you how heavy my heart is for marriages today and how broken I am and how hard it is to walk in the trenches of a mess, all for the goal of breaking peace. Peacemaking is gospel work, but peacemaking is hard work, and it doesn't happen overnight. Peacemakers are willing to confront sin for the purpose of restoring broken, broken with God and broken with others. Peacemakers will own our sin and our part in a broken relationship and will do what we can to make it right. Yesterday morning, my wife and I are having coffee. And as we're talking, I feel like she's not hearing me. And so I'm frustrated and I raise my voice and I speak to her in a way that she didn't deserve and I offended her. And I was convicted immediately. In my flesh, I wanted to be like, you deserved it. You know, that feels right. But in my spirit, God said, you make it right. You wronged her. So I pulled her aside and I said, Gwen, I'm so sorry. 
for the way I spoke to you. It wasn't right and you didn't deserve it. Will you please forgive me? You guys, that's hard. It's hard. It's hard to own your part. But this is what peacemakers do. We own our part. We get in the ring and we fight for peace. Confronting sin is never easy, but it is it's a must do. It must be done. Romans 12, 18 says, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Paul says in Romans 14, 19, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Our responsibility is to restore what's broken, not continue to tear people down and to make a mess of things. So often people want to restore through compromise when what God says we should do is resolve. And let me tell you the difference. If you're going to compromise to bring peace, you won't find peace because compromise simply says, I'm going to give something up so we can get along. And that's not what God wants. What God wants is for you to own your part, come to a place of agreement for how we can move forward together and how we're going to treat one another and then live into that, that's called resolution. Compromise focuses on the negative. Resolution focuses on the solution to the problem and keeps each other accountable. Peacemaking is hard work. Why? Because it takes time. And to be honest with you, another reason it's really hard is because peacemaking is actually heart work. And only God can change the heart. I recently heard a story of two neighbors who were disputing with each other. And to end the dispute, they decided to get together and to read the Bible and pray. And so these two men who were at odds decided to pull up a chair in, in the yard and grab their Bibles and begin to just read some scripture together and pray. Obviously, they were Christian men. And the one forgot his glasses inside and he couldn't read and he was going to be the reader and the other was going to be the prayer. And so the prayer said, oh, here, by the way, here, just use my glasses. You know, those of you who need cheaters, you know what it's like, right? And so he put them on and as he read the scripture and they prayed together, something began to dawn on him. When I begin to see life through your lens, the perspective I now hold has helped me to see your side of things. And it's drawing me in to reconcile. Sometimes we just simply need to see through the other person's eyes so that we can relate to them and right what is wrong. Secondly, peacemakers reflect God's character. This is the seventh beatitude in the list of Beatitudes that actually describes the character of the Christian. I want to remind you that the Beatitudes are not the way upon which we get saved. The Beatitudes reflect the character of a person who's a Christian and who is living out the kingdom values in life here on earth. The Beatitudes are how people see Jesus in you and me. They happen to build on each other until we ascend the ladder of Christian character formation and reach the status of being a peacemaker. I want you to consider, but just for a moment, what is the opposite of a peacemaker? A troublemaker. Now, with compassion and grace, but just directness. Can I say this? If you are a troublemaker, stop it. God doesn't want you to, yeah, get an amen sometime around here. God doesn't want you to be a troublemaker. Your family doesn't want you to be a troublemaker. Your friends don't want you to be a troublemaker. People don't want you to be a troublemaker. And I can also say this very candidly. If your life is characterized as a troublemaker more than a peacemaker, you have every right to question whether or not you truly belong to the family of God. Can I be honest? 
God wants you to be a peacemaker. It reveals who we are. It reveals who we belong to. It displays the character of God through our lives. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called, they and they alone shall be called sons of God, daughters of God. Let me contextualize what it means to be called a son of God or a daughter of God. If I was alive in the first century, my oldest son's name would not be Josiah Op. It would be Josiah, son of Trinity. And Grace would be Grace, son of Trinity. And Noah would be Noah, son of Trinity. And Luke would be Luke, son of Trinity. And Anna would be Anna, son of Trinity. And that's all I have. (laughs) but they belong to me. And if you're a peacemaker, you belong to God. And if you're a peacemaker, then God says, you're my child. The building blocks, the ladder, the character traits of the Beatitudes reveal whose we are. And it begins by being poor in spirit. Christians are people who recognize their need for God and that they can't get to him on their own. And so we look to God to help us be right related to the Father. And when we realize that and we become that, then we mourn over our sin and we feel bad about it. And so we seek the forgiveness of God and he grants it to us. And then we live humbly before God and others because we recognize that we don't deserve it, but by his grace and mercy, he gives it. And then we hunger and thirst for righteousness so that we live according to God's standard and we find our lives to be satisfied. Then we become merciful. We can enter into the trenches with people in life and recognize they're no different than I am and their struggles are the same as mine and I'm not gonna come judging you. I'm gonna come with mercy and I'm gonna lift you up so that what's broken in your life can be mended and made new again. We don't judge, we love. We become pure in heart so that we can clearly see God and his will for our life. And when we clearly see that, we become peacemakers who go into this world as children of God to make peace with people and God and make peace between us and others and then help bring others together so they can have peace too. Isaiah 9, 6 tells us that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. You want to be like Jesus? Be a peacemaker. John 14, 27 says, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. The reason the world can't give that gift is because it is only a gift that God can give. So as a peacemaker, you have a gift the world doesn't have. They're all desiring, seeking, wanting. And your job is, is to give it away and to point people where they can find it. So let's be proactive in looking for ways upon which we can be peacemakers in the spaces and places that God has put us in our family, in our friendships, in our church, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our community. Let's do our part for when we do We will point people to Jesus, which is the only place that true peace can be found. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word this morning. I pray, God, that as we live and do life together as the family of God, we will take serious our responsibility of being your ambassadors in this world, being peacemakers that truly truly reflect the character of our Father through the lives that we live. 
Help us to be people who will surround the brokenhearted, love them with mercy, and encourage them to find peace in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we close in this song together. can assure you of one thing that's true about what you just sang. The world doesn't need more of you. They need more of Jesus through you. And that's who a peacemaker is. May you go in the grace of God and be a peacemaker. If you need prayer this morning, our prayer team would be up front to stand with you and pray with you. Go with God's peace. We'll see you next time.